Welcome to the KPC Podcast. This week's message is from Pastor Steve Keller. I, uh, I just was really amazed by VBS this week. Um, the dedication, the hard work of a lot of people, Kim Soto. Wow, did she work long hours. Mark Santum. It, it's worth a hand clap to know that we got a good works week out of Mark. I agree. I mean, amen with y'all. But really, so many people, Bethany, Harrison, um, lots of parents, you saw the kids, just their contribution. It was a beautiful week. I'm going to give you a few numbers. Uh, we had 157 kids attend. Um, uh, 134 a day average, 96 families represented, over 50% were not KPC folks. So our heart, yeah, our heart, and, and this is a very deliberate thing that we're doing. We've, we've, I'll let you in on a little staff secret. We have already begun this summer to talk and to pray about the, the intentional turn we will take for the fall and the rest of KPC's life which is a turn outward, um, being a church that exists for the world. Um, Amen. So this is something we're we're really praying about. Um, I guarantee you this, as we reach out to the world and the community, um, we will not be a church that loses what this is all about, but we are going to seek just to reach our world for Christ. And we just pray, Lord, let VBS be a first fruit, and it really was. Just an incredible, incredible time. Okay, apart from that, uh, Harrison mentioned something else right after the service, and this will be a short service today because we are having a pig picking out on the lawn. Now, I, I, wanna, I just want to make sure you understand what a pig picking is, all right? We, Will and I last night uh, put a, a pig, I don't have a picture of it because I was afraid it might upset the kids. We roasted a pig all night long, all right? So this thing smoked from, I think we put it on at 10, we pulled it off the smoker at four, and then we put on little Boston butts, 10 of those on there. Folks, we've got so much barbecue. And this was done by North Carolina boys, okay? So the, the only two problems we have at this point are this. Um, Will did stay up all night. I was his assistant. Um, I went in the youth room in the middle of the night and got a couple of hours on the couch, but I, I will be preaching a little more tired than I usually do. So you could see the first pastor ever to preach himself to sleep. Um, usually he does that to you. Today he may do it to himself. The other thing is I scoured myself in, in the, the men's shower. I still smell like pig and I'm getting hungry, so I might start gnawing on my arm in the middle of this thing, all right? So, but we, we just really want you to join us. We're gonna celebrate as a family. We've invited a number of community people. Um, Will and I had folks stop by throughout the night just to ask what we were doing. Uh, got to talk to some of the policemen across the street. Uh, went to Food Line. We've told everybody about this, so you may see people today trickling in, and I ask you to do one thing. That is just to love them in Jesus' name if they show up. Eat, get to know them, just love them. And um, we're going to have fun, okay? And give Will a hug if he's still here. He told me he was going to go to bed at 11. But if he's still out there, y'all give him a big hug, all right? So having said that, here's what we're doing. Um, We decided for the first time just to carry the theme of VBS into Sunday. And we said, you know, we have this secret, which is all of these children getting ministered to all week and ministering together with us, we're just going to carry it into Sunday. So what we're doing now, we let them do worship, we let them pray and do some intros. I am bringing the big kids in on VBS today, and we are going to have one final VBS uh, lesson, okay? So for all of you grown-up kids, because we're children of God still too, I'm going to give you a VBS lesson based on the theme of this week. Now, the theme was shipwrecked and rescued, if you, you couldn't figure that out, okay? So that was the theme, and then we'll, we'll go to lunch, I don't know, 11.15 or something like that. So here's what we're going to do. Um, today, we will take a look at a man in Scripture who is shipwrecked, okay? Um, this man in this passage, he is shipwrecked spiritually, and he needs rescue. Now, because some of you are snickering, I'm taking this off because you won't take me seriously, but... He, he needs to be rescued, and he is going to go to Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the salvation of all mankind. He is going to go to Jesus Christ for rescue, and we know what Jesus is going to do. Jesus, because he is God, because he is love, 
Because Jesus is awesome, Jesus will offer this man salvation and he will offer him rescue, okay? So this is a beautiful setup. It's an incredible story. But here's the thing. Incredibly, as we will soon see, this man gets jammed up. This man isn't really sure if he can accept it. He might take rescue or he might not take rescue, okay? He may choose at the end of this story to stay shipwrecked or he may follow Jesus Christ. And that means only one thing in this moment. We have got to read this story and find out what happens to this man. It'll be familiar to many of you, but don't let that stop you from hearing it with your heart, okay? Here we are. Once a religious leader came up to Jesus and asked him this question. Good teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely, which means to lie. You must honor your father and mother. The man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was very young. When Jesus heard the man's answer, he said, there is still one thing you haven't done. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when the man heard this, he became very sad for he was very rich. When Jesus saw this, he said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard Jesus say this said, then who in the world can be saved? Jesus replied, what is impossible for people is possible with God. Then Peter said, we have left our homes to follow you. Yes, Jesus replied. And I assure you that everyone who has given up house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of of the kingdom of God will be repaid many times over in this life and will have eternal life in the world to come. Let's pray together. Oh, Father God, ironically, this is a passage about riches. Oh, Father, it it, it is about one kind of wealth that is all around us, and it is about heavenly wealth as a contrast, as the greatest reward. Father God, we, every heart hungers for you. Lord, every heart is poor until you enter. So, Father, give us the grace today. Just help us to hear, help us to understand. Father, set us on a course with you, which is all about heaven, heaven on earth, and heaven to be enjoyed forever in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so here's the story. On a very normal day back in uh, Bible times, um, a day like just about any other in Scripture, a man walked up to Jesus, which is a very normal thing. People were always going up to Jesus in Scripture. But one thing we find out very quickly is that this man is not your average everyday guy. Now, this story not only appears in Luke, it appears in Matthew. Matthew tells us that this man who walks up to Jesus, first of all, is a young man, okay? So, uh, you know, he's younger than all of your pastors, I would say perhaps in his late teens, early 20s, but he's a young man. But he's a young man who is already considered a religious leader, okay? You know, sometimes it takes a while to get into a position in leadership. This is a young man who is a leader uh, religiously, and, and he comes up to Jesus with a burning question. And just so you know, the subject of this question is the most important thing in the world. This man comes up, and the subject on his mind is eternal life. There is nothing greater than eternal life. There was nothing greater than coming to life. So this guy's got the right question, and he's asking Jesus how to get eternal life. Actually, that's not quite right, is it? Actually, the young man comes up, and he asks Jesus what he can do 
to get eternal life. In other words, this young man is asking Jesus, how can I rescue myself spiritually? You know, maybe there's some good deed I can do. Maybe there's an attendance chart at church, and if I show up enough, you know, I make all the VBSs, Jesus, there's got to be something I can do to get eternal life. Now, the children this week, y'all learned that motto. Remember the hand gesture? Okay? I'm going to do the hand gesture, and I want you to do what you did at at VBS, okay? We learned a hand gesture this week, and here it goes. One, two, three. Okay? One more time. Now all the big kids in the room. Jesus rescues. Okay, you got it. Jesus rescues, all right? Every one of us in this room knows, based on that motto, based on our time in church, in the Word of God, there is only one who rescues us, right? Jesus Christ alone is the Savior. So we, what we know is this man cannot possibly save himself. Only Jesus can save himself, but... The man has a problem. He doesn't know this. He doesn't know this yet. So what does Jesus do? Well, Jesus goes uh, uh, now. He speaks to the man. He gets in conversation with this guy to help him see, to open his eyes like the song we sung. Jesus wants his eyes to open to the fact that he cannot rescue himself. So Jesus answers back to the man who's asked this question, what must I do? to uh, inherit eternal life. Jesus asks, and y'all know Jesus does that a lot. Have you ever noticed that in Scripture? Someone asks Jesus a question, and Jesus asks a much, much better question, and that's exactly what he does here. Jesus references something that the guy just said. Jesus says back to him, just a minute ago, when you asked your question, you called me something. You called me teacher, but just before the word teacher, there was another word, and that word is good. Why did you use that word good when you called me a good teacher? And then Jesus explains a little bit. There is only one who is truly good, and that is God. God is good. So in other words, what Jesus is saying back to this young man is, when you called me a good teacher, were you saying that you believe that I am God? Now, right here, if the young man says, yes, Jesus, that's exactly what I meant. When I called you a good teacher, I was calling you a God teacher. I was saying that you are the Son of God, that I believe that. If the man says yes to the question, you know what just happened to him? He's rescued. He's no longer shipwrecked. Now, why is that? Because Romans 10, 9 says this. It says, if you confess with your mouth or you declare with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So if the man at this point in the story says, it's exactly what I meant, the man's rescued. But what does the man say in the story I just read at this point? Nothing. He doesn't say anything, and so Jesus digs in a little bit deeper with him. Knowing that he's a religious man, Jesus says, okay, well, let's, let's talk about something else. Let's talk about the Ten Commandments, and then Jesus lists five of them. He goes, as a religious leader, you know these, and so Jesus lists five of the Ten Commandments for the man. And, and, and the man says, you know what, Jesus, I not only know those five commands, I've kept all of them since I was a little boy. And essentially, Jesus, when the man says this, Jesus answers back to him and says, that is awesome. But I left a few of the commandments out. And believe it or not, in your life, you have missed one of the Ten Commandments. You have missed command number 10. You, young man, have a problem with commandment number 10. Does anybody know, just off the top of your head, what commandment number 10 is? Yes, thou shalt not covet, okay? This young man has a problem with coveting. Now, let me explain what coveting it is, because uh, coveting is not a word that we use very often in everyday language, okay? Uh, My generation and older, I don't hear us use the word often. Uh, Under me, I, I hardly ever hear the younger generation talk about coveting. Here is what coveting means, okay? It, it has two essential meanings. The first is this, coveting is to want something 
that does not belong to you. It's usually something someone else has that you think is greater. And the Bible gives a lot of examples of coveting, you know, coveting your neighbor's wife or coveting great riches, something like that. So coveting is to want something that is not yours, but coveting is also when you love something else, and it can be someone else, but when you love something else more than you love God. And when it comes to that thing, you set your heart on it. You desire it deeply. You think about it all the time. Bottom line, you want that thing more than you want God. You love that thing more than you love God. And that is this young man's problem. See, we find something else out about the rich young ruler in verse 22, well, about the, about the young ruler, I just gave it away, in verse 22, and he is rich. He has got a lot of money and a lot of stuff. It's, it's a new piece of information in the passage. And I want to tell you something about money. I want to tell you something about riches, and I hope you'll never forget it. Money and riches and stuff are not evil. There is nothing wrong with having money There's nothing wrong with having a lot of money. Um, I'll tell you why. Number one, money can be used to provide for your family. And there are a lot of families in this room that appreciate the fact that money provides for us. I mean, Jane and I feed and clothe our children with money. You know, it takes that to do it. We pay our bills with money. So we use money to provide for our family. We also use money to bless our family. You know, when a birthday rolls around or Christmas comes along or we want to celebrate or a child just has a need and something would just, you know, light up their worlds, we use money to provide and to bless our families. But you know what else we can do with money? And this is good for the American church to hear, including pastors of the American church. We can use money to bless the poor. We can use money to help people that are in need. We can also use money to improve our neighborhoods our communities. We took up an offering a minute ago. There's another great use of money. We use money to spread the love of God in the world, to share the message of Jesus Christ. So again, money isn't evil. But you know what is evil? The love of money. And that is this young man's problem. Oh, there goes my anchor. Coveting is the love of money, and the timing couldn't have been better. You know what coveting is for this guy, the love of money? It is an anchor in his life. In other words, it's not just that he has money, money has him. It, 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 it's, it's what he's all about down deep, and it's standing in the way of him and God. It's keeping him from eternal life. In other words, he's clutching his stuff so tightly with two hands that he cannot open his hands and receive salvation. And so, and so this is a real moment uh, of, of struggle for him. The love of money is keeping him from eternal life. And so what Jesus does is Jesus offers him rescue, and this young man now only has to do one thing to get off the island, right? He only has to do one thing to be rescued, one thing to be saved. And Jesus says it in verse 22, here it is, get rid of your wealth, get rid of your riches. They are keeping you shipwrecked in life. The love of money has filled your heart. This is your anchor, so get rid of it. Sell off your stuff. Give to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. And I want everybody to hear that last part. Jesus doesn't say, okay, get rid of all your money, Phil. Get rid of everything. And you know what? You get to spend the rest of your life absolutely destitute and poor, and you get to wander around the streets like like a, a homeless person. That's not what Jesus is saying. He is saying, get rid of that earthly treasure, and I will give you heavenly treasure. You will be richer spiritually than you can ever imagine if you will just get rid of this thing. Say no to coveting. And so it is for this young man, it is the offer of a lifetime. And remember who's giving the author or the offer. It is the Savior. It is coming from Jesus, from God himself. He's only got to do one thing. And at this point in the story, if we stopped right there, Every one of us is thinking the same thing. Surely this guy's going to say yes. 
There's no way this rich, young, religious ruler, there's no way he turns Jesus down. I mean, why would he not do this one thing? I mean, he's going to choose life. He's going to choose God over money and stuff. And then we read verse 23. When the man heard Jesus say this, he became very sad because he was very rich. And and Matthew writes in his gospel that when the young man heard Jesus say this, he actually just turned and he walked away. And then Jesus says something that, that benefits all of us because so far we could listen to this story and what we could be thinking to ourselves is, man, this story is not about me. It's not about me at all because I'm not rich. I mean, I could read that. You know, Steve Keller's not a rich guy. It doesn't apply. But Jesus says something next that applies to every one of us. Listen to this. Verse 24, verse 25, he says how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And just so you know, there's a real theological debate about the eye of a needle. Uh, Some people say that that is a doorway in Jerusalem, a small doorway that you had to get a camel down on his knees and walk him through. Some people say it's a literal eye of a needle. It doesn't matter. The point is made the same way. It's really hard to pull that off, okay? That, that, that's the point. And, and so the question is, who is Jesus talking to, talking about here? Is he just talking about people with a lot of money? And the answer comes back now, no, he's not. He's not talking to those who just have money. And again, we know that by looking around. There are a lot of wealthy people who have said yes to Jesus Christ, remain wealthy, they follow him, they live for him. It's not about everybody getting rid of everything. But what Jesus means here with this use of the word rich is he's saying how hard it is for people who are rich in anything else besides the love of God and hunger for God and following God, how hard it is for people who treasure and love other things dearly and hold on to them tightly to enter into the kingdom of God. And so what Jesus is saying to all of us is when it comes to whatever our riches are, we got to let them go. We've got to let them go for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of following Jesus Christ. You know, one of the things that, w- that we learned, and I learned it with the kids this week, is that we really can be rich in a lot of things, a lot of things besides God. Um, I told you about the man in this passage. He was rich in money. He was rich in, in treasures. There are some people in our world, maybe, maybe it's us today, who are kind of rich in something else. We, we value uh, things like our intellect. We value our talents and our abilities. And and it's not that we appreciate them, but oh, we've just, oh, they've become everything to us. We are so rich in our estimation of who we are and what we can do. Other people value beauty, you know, pleasure, comfort. It's the most important thing in the world to us. The kids learned something this week that I thought was tremendous that, that, that this was taught to kids. We can actually value negative things and become very rich in negative things. Here's one of our examples from the week. We had a skit and someone came out uh, and, and they were holding this and, and Mark was playing the, the, uh, you know, the, the part of the evangelist and he was trying to get someone to let go of this for the sake of the kingdom of God. And, and this, if you can't read it, it just says worry. But you know, we can become, as human beings, we can become so rich in yesterday's pain We can treasure it in a sense and value it. Yesterday's pain, worry, fear, anxiety, uh, things like that. We can be rich in a lot of different things besides God. And folks, the truth is to say yes to Jesus Christ and receive his salvation, there are some things that we valued, whether they're lies or perhaps even material, that there are some things that are in the way. And to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we got to let go of them to say yes to Jesus. Did anybody have an experience? When I got saved, I had to let go of some stuff. Did that happen to anybody else? We had to surrender a few things in our lives. 
Well, that's a beautiful principle, but here's the other thing. As Christians, sometimes we actually slide back into that old way without even realizing it. And one of the things that struck me about VBS, okay, I'm the pastor, right? I'm supposed to be the guy with all the answers who knows all the stuff. One of the things that the Lord confronted me on this week is that in my following of Jesus, he is still calling me to let go of this, let go of that. There can still be things in the Christian life that are like chains and are like anchors holding us back. Have any of you ever had that experience where you've been saved for a while and suddenly the Holy Spirit or the Word of God convicts you and you realize you've got to let go of something? You're not able to follow like you are. Whether it's offense, you know, whether whether it's something negative, whether it's something that's become valuable and dear to you. And again, the the great thing here, the, the beautiful thing about the ending of this is when we let go. When we surrender, whatever it is of this world, that it's, just, it, it, it's in conflict with us and God. It's in the way of the kingdom of God. When we let go, Jesus does not impoverish us. We are not left destitute. I, again, the promise that Jesus makes to this man, hey, get rid of that stuff. Come follow me. You'll have treasure in heaven. It comes out again at the end of the story, verse 28 through 30. Peter says this to Jesus. He says, Jesus, you know, we, uh, we disciples have actually let go of a little bit of treasure. Um, we left our homes to follow you. Now, I will tell you, Peter is kind of bragging a little bit. Um, Peter is fishing for a compliment. When I read this, I think, you know, Peter, you probably deserve a little bit of a rebuke for trying to grab a little limelight. But listen to what Jesus says back to Peter. He says, yes, you have. And I promise you that everyone who has given up earthly treasures for the kingdom of God, every one of them, every one of you will be repaid many times over in this life and in the life to come and will have eternal life. Isn't that beautiful? One final question of of the group. Has anyone ever had that experience where you let go of something for the kingdom of God You surrendered something, and what you got back from the Lord absolutely went beyond your wildest hopes and dreams. Has anyone ever experienced that? I will tell you this. I have been a Christian now for 30-something years, okay, a long time, all right? I just, I crossed the 50 barrier not too long ago. This week, I looked back over my life, okay, as a Christian. Now, I became a Christian when, when I was 12, and then I had to recommit my life when I was a teenager because I strayed a little bit. But I think of when I was 17 years old, and I said, yes, Jesus forever. In the time from 17 to 50, I have had some days that are really hard, okay? I've had some times that I would call bad. I've had some seasons that were a little bit gloomy. But following Jesus and walking with him, he has never failed me once. Jesus, Jesus has never disappointed me. And when I look back, okay, even like from year to year, you know, this has been a hard year for Jane and I for for a number of reasons, but I look back even over this hard year, who we are this year compared to who we used to be last year, it's amazing. Jesus truly rescues He saves, and he makes something beautiful out of our lives. Jesus has come to do something, all right? He has come that we might have life, and we might have life to the full. Now, that's a message that should have made you hungry. Is anybody getting close to getting hungry? Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray for us, and if you have a prayer need, please come down front because Neil's talked to our prayer folks. We'll have people here, but after this, the rest of you will go out to the lawn, games, music, uh, pig galore, and we have burgers and dogs for, for uh, maybe chicken for folks who don't want to do pork. You're on a kosher diet today. No problem. No problem at all. And, um, but we are also giving to Ghana. We want to send a team to Ghana in September. This team is about halfway there. So they could use the support of the body in any way you could give it. Most important is prayer, but other is finance. So let me pray for us. And then let's go do some eating. Father God, we love you. And we thank you, God, when we look at salvation, oh my goodness, Lord, when we think of life forever with you, we really try to put our hearts around it. And maybe we go over to Revelation 21 and we read about what heaven is like. And Lord, we we think about what our hearts are like in worship. 
Every time in prayer that we brush up against you and we, we, we feel the move of your Holy Spirit, your love within us, God, we realize that your treasure beats anything down here. And so, Lord, I I know there may be some in the room today who have never accepted Jesus Christ, and the reason is because we are holding on to something. Maybe it's pain, maybe it's materialism, maybe it's status, maybe it's, it's some type of addiction, but we're holding on to something. And today, the Word of God says, you are with us. You you promise to be with us. When we gather and worship, you're here. Well, the Lord of life is before you today. And His offer is for you like it was for the rich young man. Today, if you would hear His voice, would you respond in Jesus' name? Would you just be willing to say, Lord, right now I surrender. I let go of that thing. And in Jesus' name, I receive you. Come into my life and be Savior and be Lord. Father God, just the grace right now to just release anything of this earth that holds us back. And then, God, there's the rest of us here, a church. And Lord, as we said at the beginning of this message, Father, we're a church and we do a lot of good things on the inside. We, we, do, we have a, a life right here in this community, and we have a family, and Lord, there's ministry and prayer, and people are growing tall in Jesus, but Lord, you have put us here not for our own sakes, but for the sake of the world. And so God, I pray that you would enable us as a church and as individual Christians to just be able to let go of anything that stands in the way of us being an outward-facing, outward-reaching, evangelizing, blessing congregation. Father, there is a world out here that desperately needs you. And Lord, we've got the answer. We are the daughters and the sons of God. We carry these treasures in earthen vessels to be given away. So God, just, just Lord, whether it's fear for us as a body or Lord, just being used to think, being a certain way or God, anything that's in the way. Lord, today by faith, we would just surrender together and say yes, Lord, to your command to go into fields that are white with harvest, Uh, to go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, to go out in the power of the Holy Spirit, and to go out in the name of Jesus to make you known. Lord, we love you. And God, I want to thank you again for an incredible VBS week. Oh, God, we just bless our children once again. In Jesus' name, we bless our children. We thank you for this generation. We ask you to help us, Lord God, to be faithful to sow the love of God into them. And we thank you, Lord, as we say often around here that our kids are not the church of tomorrow, they're the church of today. So we bless them today, this generation, this family, in Jesus' name. And Father, we thank you for what's about to hit our stomachs. And uh, Lord, we bless you for it, in Jesus' name, amen. We love you, God bless you, get out there. Thank you for listening to the KPC Podcast. For more messages and information, visit kpc.org.